Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. This is the Resurrection 2020 service, and we're in day 329 of our lockdown for the COVID virus. So if you would, uh, together, as we're apart from each other, let's pray. Father, I pray that you help us that at this time of the year when we remember the resurrection of your son Jesus, that you might help us as we look at the resurrection from maybe a slightly different angle, and that you might help us, Lord, to live a life that exhibits your power in our lives, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. I pray, Lord, that for those who are troubled and those who are concerned about being uh, confined and, and locked in, Lord, that you would give them a special peace, that you would comfort them, that you might help them to be strong through this for just a little while longer. So help us, Lord, as we look at your word, we pray that your word might encourage our hearts and cause us to have more faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm glad that you guys were able to join us. We're now looking at the resurrection, the central message of Jesus. Jesus didn't just come and teach good things. He came and his, his life was centrally located on the resurrection. And I'll show you why I would say that. But before we do that, I, I'd like to look at a fictitious question from somebody. Uh, do you think it's biblical to be quarantined? Do you think it's biblical to be quarantined? I did actually have somebody ask me this question. How do we deal with submitting to the, the authorities that are put over us and still gather together? As the scripture says that we should not be in the habit of not doing, uh, about not gathering with the brethren. So what do you do? I found a scripture actually in Isaiah 26, 20, which says, Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation has passed. So I think that's probably a pretty good word to all of you guys. Um, some of us won't do that because we have other things going on, and hopefully it's for your benefit. But I think that's a pretty good word. Here, also, if you wanted a second one from the New Testament, you don't trust Isaiah, it would be Mark 1, 35, 37. It says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and he departed to a solitary place. This is what Jesus did. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him, and they said to him, everyone's looking for you. So if everyone's looking for you and wondering where you are, you can just tell them, don't worry about it. I'm in a solitary place, and I've locked down, shut my doors behind me until this thing is passed. And it's completely fine. However, if you are sick, I believe the scripture also says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick, it says in Matthew 9, 12. So that's what Jesus said. So you've got, I think, a couple of options here. So as we're here at Grace Bible Fellowship, and we're going to talk about the message of Jesus, which is the resurrection. Wherever Jesus went, he always preached about having new life. So some people are a little confused by it, and they don't understand because where's Jesus? Well, Jesus is gone. You can go to any tomb, you can go to any place in the world, and whoever's buried there, you'll see their name outside, and you'll know that their remnants are there, but not with Jesus. Jesus isn't there because the, he's been risen. So if you want to know about resurrection, it's 42 times in the New Testament, and the word is Anastasia. It, you might recognize that as a girl's name. It actually means resurrection. It means to stand to life. So uh, that's what the word means. It's listed 42 times. I'm going to go over every single, no, I'm not going to go over every single one of them. Uh, but basically, here they are. If you'd like to look at it, you can freeze frame it and look them up or if you have a good tool at home. And a lot happened that day when Jesus was crucified. If you remember what happened with the crucifixion, what we talked about Palm Sunday, Brian Walter brought to you last, um, um, on Good Friday, uh, which I, I, I resist calling it Good Friday, but that's what it is. Uh, there were a lot of things that happened, some really interesting things that happened here. Matthew 27, verses 50 to 53 says, And Jesus cried out again, with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. So at the moment which Jesus gave up his spirit, and he died, and he left this earth, it says that the temple curtain was rent in two from top to bottom, making access available for us to be able to approach God. 
And it says that the ground was shaken and the rocks were split. So there's an earthquake and there's going to be another one coming in Revelation. But all of this happened on that last day when he breathed his last. And it says, interestingly, and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of their graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Isn't it interesting, on the very day that Jesus died, before he was arisen, that because the ground was shaken and these tombs were opened, remember they were mostly in in sarcophagi or they were in tombs uh, being carved out of the rocks, they would crack and open. And there were those who were made alive by the death of Jesus Christ. It's rather interesting. Um, you know, somebody should make a movie about this. In fact, I probably, I probably did. It, you know, it's the living dead, but it's nothing like this. It's when these folks came back and they actually told about Jesus. Jesus, from the time that he expired, the time he breathed his last, Jesus was always bringing new life and light to people. In Mark Chapter 1, primarily, you could just go through the first chapter of Mark and find a dozen things where Jesus does this and the resurrection is proclaimed early in his ministry. From Mark chapter 1, verses 16 and 18, it says, And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and they followed him. Jesus is taking a a ragtag group of smelly fishermen, and he's saying, I want to give you a new life, and I want you to follow me. And he leads them into this new life. It's an interesting thing. Early on in his ministry, he begins to select disciples, and he calls them out of a place where they may have been bored. They have, I don't know about you, but if, if I had to compare what I do to being a fisherman, I'd much rather do what I do. And you'll have good days fishing and bad days fishing. And I like to pick the days that I go fishing and the places I go fishing. And I don't want to have to depend upon the weather for my livelihood. And it's an interesting thing that Jesus calls these men out of a place where they really were not to be. And he calls them to a place where we know that they've been destined to be and God calls them to be. So we see that he's bringing this new life to them, completely different, not the thing that they're used to. And he looks at them, I imagine, and says, yeah, you'll do. You're just about as, as rough a crowd. You, and it's interesting, if, if you look at when he calls Peter, I think it's in, in the book of Matthew, he calls Peter, and Peter drops to his knees, and he says, Lord, you've got to go away from me because I am a man of unclean lips. Uh, I guess he cursed like a sailor or something, but uh, well, he goes, was. So here he is going to the fisherman, and he goes, yeah, you guys will do. You're just as you know, inadequate as anybody, so you'll do. Mark chapter 1, verse 23 to 26, he begins his ministry here. And now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. Jesus would typically go to the place of learning, the synagogue, and preach. And he cried out, this man, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. So Jesus is beginning his new ministry, and he's bringing a new life to somebody who was possessed, who came right into the temple area, which tells me you need to, when you go to church, you need to expect anything from anyone, because anything could happen. So here's this demon-possessed person who shows up and screams out and starts proclaiming him to be the Christ, which is who he is. Except it's bad advertising when the one who's advertising for you is the devil. And so Jesus shuts him down, casts out the demon with this loud shout, this man now has a new life. I wonder if he even knew what he was doing. I wonder if he had any cognizant idea of his behavior and his language before. So here's somebody who has a new life. So Jesus is giving new life everywhere he goes, not just in his death, but also in his life early on in his ministry. And it's not the first time he's done it. If you remember the Mount of Transfiguration, I think it's in Matthew chapter 11. He goes up onto the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and he's transformed. And 
his glorious self is actually seen by them and Peter gets excited and wants to stick around and the Lord says, no, we gotta go, uh, the Jersey version. And they all go down the hill and at the bottom of the hill there's a boy who's possessed with a demon and they don't know what to do with him. The, the disciples don't know how to get this kid fixed and so Jesus actually shows up and takes care of him. So we see that he's always in the midst of doing this. If you remember, there was another passage in Mark 5, 15. It says that they came to Jesus and they saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion and sitting clothed in his right mind and they were afraid. Jesus goes to the land of the Gennesarets and we see this in chapter 5 where he runs into this demon-possessed man who lives in the tombs and he's well known. Nobody goes near there, nobody goes over there. And I'm sure the fishermen in Galilee heard him screaming and yelling from where they were fishing on the sea. And they would chain him and he'd break the chains and he, he could not be contained. Jesus selects to go over the sea to go and have a confrontation with this guy, although the disciples don't know. So they all attend him and I can see him running up to Jesus saying the things that he said, and he says, you know, are you here to torment us before the time? And, uh, and he asks some questions, and then he casts him out, and this guy has a new life. He's back to himself. Except the demons that were in him were cast out into a herd of pigs, and the pigs all went down the slope and into the water and drowned and died. But this man was free. Um, I'm not sure what the people at Peter would say, but these pigs, many of them were dead, but this man was alive. Well, the, the eyewitnesses come and they see this guy who was known as Legion because he had a legion of demons in him. He wasn't just one, it was a bunch. And they were cast out and he was in his right mind sitting and clothed, which means somebody had to give him some clothes because he didn't have any. And he was in his right mind. And they said, you got to leave here, Jesus. We don't want anything to do with you. This is, you know, you killed all our pigs. And that's really all that they were concerned about. You see, Jesus gave a new life. He gave an opportunity for the guys that were hurting the pigs to have a new life, except they refused. And they didn't want anything to do with him. And so they cast him out. And there are people that will hear about Jesus and they'll hear about who he was and they'll understand he's a historical figure and all of that. But they won't believe a word he says. And they certainly wouldn't commit their life to him as the son of God. But then he gives new life to this man. And that was the most important thing. And then Jesus jumped back in the boat and went to the other side. It's as though he had an appointment with this guy that the disciples didn't know about. But as we read through, we know Jesus knew this. And so he goes over and he gives him new life as well by casting out a demon. Another one where he casts out demons is in Mark chapter 9, verse 20 to 27. And they brought him, the one who was possessed, to him, meaning Jesus. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. He fell down on the ground and he wallowed, fo foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, Jesus did, how long has, he, has this happened to him? And he said, from childhood. Often he has thrown himself both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the people come running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you in the name of him and in the name to come out of him and enter him no more. And then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. Actually, that word arose is that word Anastasia. And he rose. He rose from the dead, that's what he means. This guy was dead. These demons left him dead and, and flat on his back, which sin will do that for you. And Jesus pulls him up. It's an interesting story. And the disciples couldn't cast the demons out, but Jesus could. You know, sin will always do that. It stay longer than you've ever wanted it to stay. It will hurt you and take you further than you've ever wanted to go. So that's what happened to him, and Jesus raises him up. So Jesus is always in the midst of bringing new life wherever it is that he goes. He heals lepers. Uh, when I was a kid, I thought it was leopards, but it's not. It's lepers. 
Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 42. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him, which you're not supposed to do. And said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. So a leper, if you had leprosy, it was a a disease of the skin and it was highly communicable. You could give it to other people. They could get it from your clothing. uh, And it's now eradicated essentially from, from the face of the planet, except in certain places. You were not allowed to touch anyone. Wherever you would go, you would have to cry out, unclean, unclean, as a warning. There was no touching, there was no handshaking. You want to talk about social distancing. There was no kissing, there was no anything because you would get leprosy from the person that you were with. Jesus saw him, had compassion, and touched him, which is an amazing thing. Because the person that no one wanted to touch and go near, Jesus drew near and touched. And he's still that way today. In fact, I think... It's the one who's lost in the wilderness that Jesus prefers to go after instead of the 99 that are in the fold where they should be. And that's the way that Jesus is. And here again, he's bringing new life. Here's here's a man who had never had touch, never had personal contact, and suddenly he was made whole and able to do that. And of course, Jesus tells him, please don't tell anybody, and he tells everybody, and uh, they, they begin to press in on Jesus to the point where he can't do any ministry anymore. So Uh, He was actually telling him to do a good thing by not sharing it until he got out of Dodge. But here's a man who had a new life, who Jesus came and touched when no one else wanted anything to do with him. So Jesus does this. And we see in Mark chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. It says, as he passed by, this is Jesus, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And so he arose, there's that word again, Anastasia, and followed him. And now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. So Jesus selects this man they call Levi, who you might know as Matthew, who writes the book of Matthew, the gospel. This is how Jesus picks him. He goes and he sees him sitting at his tax desk, And he says, you, come follow me. And he gets up and he follows him. And then he has a party at his house. Now you can imagine, a tax collector was one of the lowest people, not an IRS agent. This is a tax collector who is a Jew by birth and yet has sold themselves to the Romans to extract payment and usury, an unusually high amount of tax, from people and pocket what he could. So he was basically a government-sanctioned thief. So here's a guy who gave up his rights, his heritage of being part of Israel and worked for the enemy. This guy, Jesus selected out of everyone that was there. And he said, you follow me, and he does. And then he gives a party at his house and you can imagine the kind of friends that Levi has, much like himself, tax collectors and sinners. So as the the religious right are following Jesus and watching his every move and criticizing, He sees Jesus in at a party, and he might have a glass of wine. And he's with all of these tax collectors, and the Pharisees begin to criticize him and say, look at this guy, he can't be the Messiah. He's drinking and eating, and he's cavorting, he's hanging out with all these sinners. He couldn't possibly be. And so as they're doing that, Jesus overhears them, and he tells them this. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus said, my place is with these people. My place is not with you who think you are so righteous that you got no use for me and all you're full of is judgment and finger pointing. I haven't come for you. The doors of your heart are shut to me. So I haven't come for you. I've come for these folks. And guess what? Levi responds. And he becomes Matthew, we know one of the 12 disciples, and thank God that he selected Matthew. We have such great information in the book of Matthew because of it. And so here's Jesus bringing new life, somebody who's resurrected. He now has his Jewishness back, 
And he's now able to recognize the Jewish Messiah, and he was selected by Jesus himself. We see here in John chapter 9, verses 1 to 3, Jesus heals a blind man. Verse 1, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see, when the disciples see somebody who's blind, they instantly think this is the theological conversation. We need to ask Jesus this really hard question and stump the rabbi. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Stop for a minute. Think about this. Why does God let certain things into this world? Why does he allow evil and hardship and blindness from birth? Why does he do that? Well, it might be because God wants to show his glory through it, just like it says here. It might be that the power of God has just been waiting for this day for him to get healed, and that's exactly what Jesus does. Why has this, been, this man been blind from birth? Well, so that I could walk along one day and heal him and so that you guys would get to see him. It's essentially what Jesus said. Maybe that's why I'm here. Maybe that's why you're here. Because you're just messed up enough that if Jesus does a work in you and the world looks on, they say, yeah, it must have been God. So, carrying on, verse 39. Oh, I'm sorry. Carrying on with the next story, which is in Mark chapter 5, verse 39 to 42. Jesus not only raised himself from the dead, but he also raised others from the dead. And there's three instances one is in Mark 5, 39. It says, And when he came, he said to them, Why do you make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. He was called by Jairus, who was a religious ruler, and he was called to come to his house. He got a little delayed because somebody was tugging on his robe, and they ended up getting healed by that. But once he finally got free, he was able to get there. But she's dead. She's not even sick anymore. And, he, and everybody's uh, weeping, and they ridiculed Jesus because he said, she's only sleeping. But when he had put them all outside, which is a good place to put everybody who's ridiculing, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him, and they entered where the child was laying. And then he took the child by the hand, and he said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement. So Jesus himself raised the dead. And there are two other instances when he does this. When somebody is on their back, breathe their last, it's over, they've, they're done. And Jesus raises them because Jesus has life within himself. Our next one comes is the resurrection of Lazarus. And it's in John 11, 25 and 26. If you remember, he was called to come. The one who you love is sick, Lord, so come. And Jesus said, okay, and he purposely waited three days. And then a messenger came and said, he's, he's gone. And Jesus said, okay, now I'll go. And as he's going, the disciples go with him. And of course, Thomas doesn't think very well of that. And he goes, you know, they tried to kill you last time we were in that neighborhood. And all right, let's, let's all go and die with Jesus. Very sarcastically, I'm sure he said it that way. And so they go, and as he goes, he waits. And one of the, the sisters of Lazarus, Martha, comes to him and said, you know, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus explains to him, explains to her who he is. He's trying to get a message across that she's not understanding. And she goes back and she tells Mary, her sister, now, Mary is the soft-hearted one. Martha is the tough one, the older sister. Mary comes and is weeping, and she falls down at his feet, and she says, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And you can tell that the sisters have been talking. Where's Jesus? We called for him, and he's not here. Uh, sometimes he takes his time because his timing's perfect and ours is not. So Jesus then comes, and he says, show me where you've laid him. And he comes to the place where Lazarus is, and you know how the story goes. But in the midst of him speaking to Mary, he says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? 
Jesus actually asks Martha, I believe it was, do you believe this? I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you flat out, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, although he dies, he, he'll live and he'll never die. Do you believe this? And she says, oh, I believe that he'll, he'll be raised in the resurrection. And Jesus begins to weep. He's trying to communicate something that they don't understand. And so finally he says, okay, where have you laid him? And they, and they say, I'll show you. And so they go along with all the mourners and everyone else. And they go to the place where he is. And he looks into the tomb and he says, roll away the, t- well, roll away the stone. And everybody's aghast. And they say, no, Lord, he's been dead for four days. By now he stinks. And nobody wants to, nobody's got time for that. So let's not do that. And Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you'd see the power of God? And they say, okay. And I imagine a bunch of the the burly disciples uh, grab the stone and they roll it away. And he shouts into there, Lazarus, come forth. And everybody stands around looking at each other because Jesus just doesn't believe in death, apparently. And Lazarus, fully clothed, wrapped with linens and spices, comes out like a, a mummy. Like a mummy. To the point where Jesus looks over at his disciples and they go, he goes, you see this? Unwrap him. And he, they, they want him to get cut away so he can actually walk. So they actually see who he is. Because he was resurrected. Actually, he was resuscitated, which is slightly different. But Jesus gets resurrected. This is the second time that Jesus actually raises from the dead with Lazarus. The third time we see here in Luke chapter 7, verses 12 to 15. And when he had come near to the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. And the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said to her, do not weep. It's interesting, he had compassion on her, not on him. He had compassion on her being a widow. Then he came and he touched the open coffin. By the way, it's another thing a good Jewish boy never does, is touch a dead thing. Never. You you disqualify yourself from all sorts of things. And those who carried him stood still. It's a good idea. Jesus comes near and wants to touch the dead body. You just stop what you're doing. And he said, young man, I say to you, Arise, by the way, that's that same word, Anastasia. And so he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. It's interesting. He sat up, began to speak. The other girl, she sits up and she begins to walk around. These folks are animated. They're alive. Now, you don't hear them speak. In fact, none of the ones that are risen from the dead do you ever hear speak. It's a rather interesting thing. I just found that as going through my own studies. So here are three instances where Jesus brings new life, literally, brings life into a dead body. So, another place where he brings new life, in John chapter 21, this is after his resurrection, and he comes to the disciples. The disciples are are hanging around. They've they've definitely uh, had enough of being closed indoors, as you might know what that's like, and they've had no social contact because they feel like the Romans are going to come and kill them. And so what Peter does, he says, I'm going fishing. <laughs> and so he heads out, and the disciples say, well, we're going with you, because they're, they're tired of sitting around. So they go out, and they go fishing. They go fishing all night, and they catch nothing. Peter, the great fisherman, has decided to go back to his first vocation, which is fishing for fish. What he used to do before Jesus came and told him, you're to be a fisher of men. And he goes out, and he goes fishing. Well, all night, morning breaks, a voice from the shore, calls out to them when morning had come and Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. I'm not sure if it was the fog or he had a hoodie on, but they didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? It's an interesting thing to call them. And they answered him, no. And they probably all looked at Peter condescendingly. And he said to them, Cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Now this is a deja vu moment for everybody because the fishermen who were out there previously, Peter and Andrew, they did this once before with Jesus and they caught 
tons of fish. And now a voice from the shore is now telling them to do the same thing all over again. And so they cast it, and now they were not able to draw in the net because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, by the way, that's John, he always refers to himself as that in his own gospel, said to Peter, it is the Lord. <laughs> it's like no kidding. So then Simon Peter heard this, that it was the Lord. He put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, because that's what you do when you're sweating. You take off your stuff. And he plunged into the sea, which seems like an apparent suicide. But Peter wasn't coming back, and he didn't care about the fish anymore. He completely let go of the fish. In fact, he wasn't even going to help pull it in. He's done. He jumps out of the boat, and he's swimming back to Jesus, which is where he could be. And so afterwards, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? The question is, did he mean, do you love me more than the other disciples or do you love me more than these fish? Because the interesting thing is, Jesus had gone back to fish, even though Jesus said, from now on, you're going to be a fisher of men. But he also said in the Last Supper, he said, I don't care if everybody leaves you, I will never leave you. So it very well could have been the disciples. It very well could have been the fish. But Jesus said, do you love me more than these? And I don't know what it is, but Jesus speaks to all of us. And do you love me more than fill in the blank? Of course, we need to answer that question as well. And so he says to him, yes, Lord, I know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. And he says this to him three times. And Peter's grieved by the third time Jesus says this. And he says, Lord, you know that I love you. But he doesn't say love in the same love that Jesus does. He says, I phileo you. I love you like a brother. And Jesus says, do you love me? Agape. Do you love me unconditionally? And finally, the third time, he comes down and he says, okay, Peter, do you truly love me like a brother? Phileo. And he says, Lord, you know that I phileo. You know I love you like a brother. You see, Peter stopped boasting. He was a different man that day. He left the fish, he left the disciples, he left the boat, and he was done. And Jesus said, you know, there's, there's going to be a day when somebody leads you to a place where you don't want to go, indicating what kind of death he would die. And Peter didn't want to hear that either. <laughs> and he did what many of you and I probably do. He looked behind him and he said, what about this guy? And he starts talking about the Apostle John. And he says, well, what's it to me if I want him to stay until I come? You follow me. And that's what Jesus tells all of us to do. Don't worry about the next guy. Don't worry about the guy beside you, behind you, or on the TV. What about that guy? You're not asking him to, to sacrifice so much. Don't worry about somebody else. You worry about what Jesus calls you to do. So, here again, Jesus, after the resurrection, right after on the third day of his resurrection, he's walking on the road to Emmaus behind a couple of disciples that are having an intense conversation. And they're talking about how disappointed they are in Jesus. Because, well, they thought he was all that in a bag of chips, and he just was not. It begins in Luke chapter 24, verses 17 to 24. Jesus kind of pulls up alongside them, behind them, and he says, what kind of conversation is it that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? <laughs> it's like, why the long faces, boys? What are you talking about? Verse 18, and the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you only a stranger in Jerusalem and have you not known the things which have happened here in these days? Sarcasm. It's everywhere in the Bible, just so that you know. And he said to them, what things? Acting like he has no idea. Now, you've probably never done this, but if you're a parent, you do this all the time. Kids will come and tell you something. You say, what are you talking about? And you know exactly what they're talking about. You just let them go. He said to them, what things? And so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people and how the chief priests and the, our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and they crucified him. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. They, when they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And then he, meaning Jesus, said to them, 
O foolish ones, and slow to heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Wouldn't that have been a Bible study to listen to? Jesus, speaking from Moses and the prophets, spoke of all the passage concerning himself and about how the Messiah would have to come and suffer and die for the sins of the people. An amazing sermon, I'm sure, that Jesus gave. And still, they don't know who he is because they think he's dead. And so as they're walking along, Jesus is speaking to them, and they don't know it's the voice of Jesus. So it gets dark, and they finally come to the door where they're, they're going to pair off the road, and Jesus continues on as though he's going to continue on the road. And they say, well, listen, it's dark, it's late, you really shouldn't be out. Uh, you got no light, you got, in fact, you got no wallet, you got nothing. You, you shouldn't be out. So why don't you come with us? And so they invite him in to eat, and they have him sit in a place of prominence, undoubtedly, because he's a guest. And they ask him to break the bread and say the Shema. They ask him to break bread, and as he breaks the bread, they instantly know it's him. And they look, and they went, <gasps> and he disappears from their sight. And they say, didn't our hearts burn within us? Their eyes were open, and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight, and they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? You see, Jesus brought new life to those men who had no hope. They thought that Jesus was dead and gone. And he brings new life and a resurrection in their hearts. He, and they, they talk of it as a heartburn. You know, didn't our hearts burn within us when he spoke and he opened the scriptures to us? And Jesus still does that today when we open up the scriptures and he speaks to us. He reignites our heart in a place where very often the, the fire has gone out. Jesus has always brought new life and light to all who spend time with him, always. And Jesus is still doing that today. And that's what the resurrection is about. It's about Jesus coming and bringing new life to you. It's about you living out the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if he's come and made residence in your heart, then you are his vessel and he dwells within you. If that's the case, there should be light shining out of us. There should be hope. There should be faith that we have because Christ is in us. And yet, as seen from all of these slides and all of these testimonies, sometimes we can lose sight of that fact. So, what about you? You got a dead-end job with no purpose, maybe like the disciples that Jesus called. Maybe you need to hear Jesus calling you so he can give you new life. Some deep spiritual problem, maybe a demon or two in your life that you'd like to see cast out. Well, Jesus is in the midst of always bringing light and life. <clears throat> Sorry. Something separating you from others? Something like the leper had that separated you from intimacy with other people? Could it be unforgiveness? Could it be a bitterness that you're holding on to? You know, that's like a leprosy that will just eat you alive. You know, Jesus can come and, and just... With one word, he can take it away. And suddenly we're reconciled to God simply by confessing our sins. And he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you need purpose or maybe better friends like our friend Levi? He had all the wrong friends. He was in a very affluent surrounding and his life was basically about filling his pockets and about making money. You know, it's funny, a disease that suddenly quarantines everybody will really make you assess what's valuable. <laughs> and I imagine Levi, once Jesus called him, he had a completely new life. And suddenly those things that he valued at some point, they weren't valuable at all. And he gave. And he wasn't the last. So, a victim of questionable parenting or a lack of vision, like the, the man who couldn't see from when he was blind, you know, the very fact that you're hearing my voice today might be that Jesus wants to open your eyes to something so that you see something that you've never seen before. Maybe it's to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Maybe it's to be free from something that's blinded you for years. And the Lord wants to open up your eyes. Maybe it is your parenting. Maybe it's your background. Maybe it's things that you've done in the past. Jesus can forgive you of those things and take away the guilt of that because he takes it upon himself on the cross, as the Bible teaches. 
So, you need a new life, a real life. I mean, a real life that's going to take you somewhere. What about falling back into old habits? Like Peter said, I'm going to go fishing. And he goes back to his old vacation because he's just discouraged with the whole um, being on Jesus' side and Jesus is, you know, persona non grata and he's being sought by the Romans. And he slipped back into his old lifestyle. He got some old habits that maybe Jesus is going to show up and do something way beyond anything that you can imagine. Confused about what Jesus is doing in your life? Like the disciples on the road to Emmaus where they said, you know, we thought he was a prophet. We thought he was this man from God who was going to do these things, but he's dead now. It's times like that that you're never alone and Jesus will come up on you and he'll begin to speak to you. And maybe he will speak to you beginning with Moses and the prophets, all the things that Jesus has done and said, all that the scriptures have said about him. And he still does this today. If you ask him, he'll do it. So I just want to leave you with a thought in John chapter 5, verses 24 to 29. Jesus is saying these words, if you can remember this. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. And you shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. The resurrection of Jesus is hope, it's strength, but it's also condemnation to anyone who thinks that the life that we live in this plane is all there is. Because there's a day when the Son of God will shout from heaven and with the trump of an archangel and we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. If you would pray with me. Father, I pray that you would take these words, your word, and that you might settle them into the fertile soil of hearts that you would grow what is good and pleasing for you and each one of us as we digest your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.